Well, it's good to be back, good to be home. It's been a week in Israel, and uh, it's nothing like going, and, and, and also there's nothing like coming, coming back. <laughs> I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> We're continuing this, this series called Best Sermon Ever. Pastor Mike kicked it off last, last week. Uh, we titled the series not, not necessarily because it, you know, in hopes of his best sermon or my best sermon ever, <laughs> but because Jesus, Jesus first preached this on the Sermon on the Mount. If you were here last week with us, I showed a video uh, from the Sermon on the Mount and with the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful sight. It's a beautiful sight as we walked up this mountain and stood in an area where many believe that, that this could have very well been the area that Jesus you know, instructed his disciples with Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. And the, and the reason is, uh, the reason is not because, not because a building was built there, but because it is situated in such a way that serves as a, as a little bit of a reverb, reverb as one speaks and uh, many can hear. And so we know that in chapter 5, the beginning of chapter 5, Jesus begins to instruct his disciples, those that he's just called to come and follow him, to then become fishers of men. And he takes the next, uh, what we have broken into, chapters, chapter 6, chapter 7, and it's the Sermon on the Mount. Now, verse 17 through, through 20, what we have before us is, is not an easy text. I'm just going just to throw it out there, right, from the beginning. It's, this is an easy text, uh, but this text is, is going to be crucial for the next two weeks, Jesus is going to take six, like the big six, like six important, six important uh, laws, and uh, he's going he's gonna to teach on them. And so if we don't have a grasp uh, from this section, verses 17 through 20, uh, we're going to have a, a real difficult time in the next two weeks. And so we're not going to run from it. We're going to press in. We're going to ask the Lord to speak, speak through me as messenger, speak through his word. And I want to encourage you to open up the Bible for yourself and follow along. If you need a Bible, we have some Bibles in the back. If you're in the house, there's a, you can scan that QR code and follow along digitally. If you're online with us, there's a link in the comment section. You can follow along with us as we, as we dive into the Word of God today. The main idea is that Jesus fulfills the law. Jesus fulfills the law. The law. Look at verse 17. Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. This is what Jesus says. This is how he begins this, this next section of teaching, if you will. He says, don't think that I came to abolish. What is that word abolish? To, to destroy. Don't, think, don't, don't you think that I've come to, to uh, destroy the law? Or the prophets. Now the law and the prophets refers to the Old Testament. Matthew begins the New Testament. And so Jesus is referring to the Old Testament. Particularly he's referring to the some 613 commands found throughout the Old Testament. Now pause just for a moment and let that just kind of sink in. Try to live your life in accordance to 613 commands. I mean, I told the 9 a.m., uh, I told the 9 a.m., I, I, I struggle with following, following like the speed limit law, you know what I'm saying? And I, I couldn't imagine having to live my life with 613 of these commands. Now, of the 613, just as a side note, you didn't ask for it, but I'm going to throw it out, especially just coming out of Israel. Uh, uh, not all of these 613 commands are observed, and so... Some of y'all might feel a little bit of relief, or, or at least for the Jewish people. Uh, and, and, and you might say, well, why? why? Why are all 613? Well, in 70 AD, Titus marched through Jerusalem and destroyed the, the temple. And, and so uh, some of these 613 commands had to do with when you come to the temple and you make this sacrifice or you bring the sacrifice. And, and so some of these uh, laws, these commands were in accordance to the second temple. Well, the temple's not there. Uh, we, uh, in fact, visited the site on Temple Mount. It's the Dome of the Rock that you see in all these pictures. We visited last week this site. And uh, 
and it's a, it's a mosque, it's a shrine that's there. Um, the temple's coming. Uh, one, one day, one way, we don't know how or what, but that's a prophecy to still be fulfilled. And so Jesus refers to uh, the laws in the Old Testament. Then he, did, did you catch the word prophets? The prophets, what is he referring to? As you read through the Old Testament, what you come across the latter part of the Old Testament are major and minor prophets. Major and minor prophets. And in case you're wondering, they're not distinguished major and minor because one content's better than the other. It is the inspired word of God. God spoke to his messenger. That man of God received that word and called the people of God to repentance they were prophets of old. It's simply minor and major distinguished because some are like three chapters and others are like 50, you know? And so but Jesus speaks of the kingdom of heaven. We've been talking about that. That was the series, The Blessed Life. We looked at these eight Beatitudes. How do you walk in the kingdom? How do you live in the kingdom? How do you partake in this kingdom of heaven? How do you live according to this standard of righteousness? And, and he refers to fulfilling the law. We see again, verse 17, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Jesus is making the point for those that would have ears to hear back then. And those of us that would have ears to hear even now, Jesus is making the point that no one could hold to all of these laws with perfect obedience. None of us could hold to all of these laws with perfect obedience. I mean, just take, for example, the first of the year. It comes around every year, you know? And, uh, and with it, there's all kinds of goals and aspirations. I've never met one person, right, that has set major goals and, and actually kept them through the entire month of January. Uh, and, and if that's you, come on, see me later. Uh, I will love to shake your hand and be impressed. But, but can you just imagine trying to hold to all of these laws with perfect obedience? And so again, Jesus is making this point that there's only one who can hold with perfect obedience. And his name is Jesus. Jesus alone is the only perfect person to walk this earth. Romans chapter 10, verse 4, Paul writes to the church in Rome, and this is what he says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Who's the end? It's Christ. Who's the only perfect one? It's Christ. He's the only perfect one to walk out with perfect obedience. Now, by the way, that's not a pass for you and I just to live however we want. <laughs> you might be thinking, well, all right, cool. <laughs> you know, it's that, that's, my, that's my answer. That's what I'm looking for. That's why I came today. No, as Jesus is Lord of our lives, there's this desire within us, and we're going to get here in just a moment, but there's this desire within us to strive to live the life that God has called us to live, to live that, that standard that we find in his holy word. Don't think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Jesus fulfills the law. Look at verse 18, Matthew chapter 5. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, Till heaven and earth pass away, till it's all over, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Until all things are accomplished. Let's look at this just for a moment. Look at this just for a moment. You see, the, not the smallest letter, not the smallest letter. Other translations, we heard it read, not one iota. Your parents ever said that? Your grandparents ever said that? Somebody you know said that? Not one iota. What, what, what's, that re, what's that referring to? Iota is the smallest letter of the Greek alphabet. The smallest letter of the Greek alphabet. That's what that referred to. If you wonder where did it come from, well, here's your answer. It's right here. 
that the next Jesus says, or one stroke of a letter, one stroke of a letter. You ever use the verbiage, dot every I, cross every T? Where did it come from? Right here. Jesus. Jesus said it. Or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Until all things are accomplished. What is Jesus talking about? It is the assurance that Jesus himself fulfills the law in us by his perfect obedience. It's the assurance. We see the words in verse 18. Until all these things are accomplished. What is it? It's the assurance that Jesus himself fulfills the law in us by his perfect obedience. Obedience. I was reading this text from Romans chapter 3 early this morning and felt the leading of the Lord to, to add it to kind of a last minute here in Romans chapter 3 verse 21. Romans chapter 3 verse 21. It's not on the screens. Would you listen or turn in your Bibles even? But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. The righteousness of God has been revealed. How has it been revealed? Attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all, to all who believe, since there is no distinction. It's to all who will believe. Praise God that there's a way out. You might be saying, I, you don't know how, what kind of sinner I am. I, I hear it all the time as a pastor if I walk through those doors. The whole thing's going to fall in. Uh, not one time has the thing fallen in because somebody walked through the doors, okay? Uh, and you, that, you might have been known for that saying. But there's no distinction between the, the sinner. We're all condemned to hell. That's why we need Jesus the Savior to completely forgive us of all of our sins. He who is righteous makes us the righteousness of God. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Again, that's good news. That we're all level. We're all level at the foot of the cross. For all have sinned and, and fall short of the glory of God. We've all missed that mark. We've all missed that standard. That, that standard of perfection. That standard of righteousness. We've all fallen short of it. Now sadly many, and, and even you before Christ, me before Christ, Tried to work towards that standard. Tried to be good enough. If I can just do one good act today, I'll be good enough. Uh, if I just do these certain things, it will be good enough. And can I just tell you that it will never be good enough because the standard is perfection. And there's only one to ever walk this earth in perfection, in perfect obedience. And his name is Jesus. Verse 24 Romans 3, they are justified. What is that word justified? They're, they're made right. They are justified freely by his grace. They're made right freely by his grace. Grace, what is it? It's something that you and I can't earn. It's, it's something you and I don't deserve. It's the unmerited favor of God. He's poured out upon us. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Have you paused lately just to say thank you Jesus for redeeming me. For saving me. For setting me free. From, for forgiving me of all my sins. For, for giving me that living hope uh, uh, today. And, and, and for a, an eternal hope in heaven one day. Thank you Jesus for your redemption. When, when I thought it was over. Jesus stepped in. Verse 25. God presented himself as an atonement sacrifice. An atoning sacrifice in his blood. God presented himself. God presented himself as an atoning sacrifice in his, in his blood received through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. It's always, uh, always blows my mind when I pause to consider that Jesus has forgiven me of all my sins. Not just a few of them. Not just the ones that I think need them. They all need them. <laughs> and not just my past. Praise God. But my future. Forgiven of all my sins. 
God, verse 26, God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. You and I are declared righteous, not because of the amount of good works that we could ever do. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3 tells us we are declared righteous because of the righteous one who is Jesus. And Jesus fulfills the law. He fulfills the law. Look to verse 19. Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Listen, the, the Christian is done, the, the, the Christ follower is done with the law as a means of gaining a righteous standing before God. Righteous standing before God. Galatians chapter 2 verse 21 says, I do not set aside the grace of God. I, I can't set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. If I can attain a place of righteousness, if I can attain a place of perfection, if I can enter heaven on my own merit, then Christ came for, for nothing. But there's no way that you and I could ever attain that. It's found only. It's secured only in the great sacrifice of our Savior, who is, who is Jesus. Verse 20, for I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. And we might read that verse and say, oh, man, you know, I'm, I'm really not as good as, as, I, as I'd like to be, <laughs> or I, I'm really not as good as some people might even think that I am. Uh, and certainly, like, when this person, you know, I was in the airport in Tel Aviv on Monday, and uh, we were waiting my flight. I was drinking a coffee, and I'm sitting there drinking a coffee, and I just start seeing one by one these men stand up and take the uh, uh, garb, and <laughs> put it on, and put the box on the head, and take out the book, and start rocking back and forth, and to the east, and they're praying, and they're reading, and Jewish men, and, and, and then I, I see ladies stand up, put the head covering, and, and, and open up the book, and, and, and they start rocking back and forth, and I'm thinking, man, I'm just sitting here drinking my coffee. <laughs> Am I as dedicated as these guys? <laughs> I, I mean, they, 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 they're, they're putting it all out there. Verse 20, Jesus says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees. Who are the scribes and Pharisees? It's the religious leaders of the day, okay? It's the religious leaders of the, of the day. Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses the religious leaders of the, of the day, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. And you might be thinking, how could I ever get in the kingdom of heaven? Religious leaders of Jesus' day set the standard for of righteousness. They set the standard of righteousness. Paul writes to the church in Philippi in chapter 3, verse 5, and he says this. Circumcise the eighth day. Why, why is that important? Because it goes all the way back to Genesis. There was a covenant, a circumcision covenant. So anyone born should be circumcised on this particular day. To hold to this law, to hold to this covenant. Paul was one of them. He says, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, doesn't get any better than this. He says, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee. This, this is Paul with his great accolades, great resume. It's impressive that he would memorize all of this, these first five books of the, the Torah. Paul lived this out. And religious leaders of Jesus' day set the standard of righteousness. And Jesus is just about to flip this. In early 1992, tenants let three apartments in an orthodox neighborhood in Israel burn to the ground while they asked a rabbi whether a telephone call to the fire department on the Sabbath violated Jewish law. Let that sink in for a moment. Later on, it was reported that the rabbi said, yes, call, but it was too late. 
They said, do I, I need permission to pick up the phone. You might be thinking, well, why? It's just a phone. Well, observant Jews are forbidden to use, to use the phone or anything connected to electricity on the Sabbath because doing so would break an electrical current, which is considered a form of work. And so the Sabbath begins at Friday at it gets dark right on Friday and goes all the way to Saturday. Many, uh, I'm always in Israel, of course, on a Shabbat, a Sabbath day. And, and it's always interesting that the hotels are flooded with Jewish families that are still trying to hold to the laws. And they come to these hotels and the reason they come to these hotels is because they don't have to cook. They don't have to clean. They get to relax. They can only, there's only a few steps that they can walk before they have to rest. And there's couches everywhere. And you, some of y'all think, man, that's the life, right? <laughs> but every one of these hotels, there's Shabbat ele uh, elevators. And, and they stop at every floor so that they don't even have to push the button. And it's always, to me, one of the saddest days because I know Saturday morning I'm going to wake up and there's not going to be any hot coffee and I'm going to have to settle with, like, lukewarm. And this is nasty. And so that's generally a day that I pass and have, I fast on, on coffee that day. But, but, but that's not the point of the story. The point of the, point of the story is, is it's the works. Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul says this, regarding zeal, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, he was so zealous, he was so committed as an observant Jew, that he persecuted the church. We see in Acts chapter 8, a great wave of persecution came over the church. And, and Paul, who was Saul at that time, led that charge. He says, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. Like he's holding it. He's, he's dotting every I. He's crossing every T. He says in verse 7, look at this, listen to this. But everything that was a gain to me, everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. Everything that I live for, everything that I built up, I consider to be a loss because of Christ. Verse 8, more than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my, my Lord. Man, what a message for us. What are we living for? What's the pursuit of our life? What has the priority? What has our attention? Paul said, according to earthly standards, according to the law, man, I lived it. I set the tone. And now, in Christ Jesus, this is what he says. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and considered them as dung. All my accolades, all my, my past, it's just crap. So that I may gain Christ. None of it matters anymore. Christ and Christ alone is Paul's number one priority and his number one satisfaction and his number one affection. He's realized that the righteousness doesn't come through the works of the law, but the works of one person who is Jesus. Verse 9, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Look back to chapter 5, verse 20, for I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven, unless it surpasses unless it exceeds and, and church I want you to hear today clearly that we can exceed their righteousness because our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees because our righteousness comes through Christ Jesus though the righteousness of the religious leaders was impressive to those watching their righteousness could never prevail before God Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 says 
All of us have become like something unclean. All of us. All of us. And all of our righteous acts are like polluted garment. All of us wither like a leaf. And our iniquities carry us away like the wind. Romans 3 describes it so well. None of us are righteous. No, not one. We are not made righteous by keeping the law or doing the right things. We are made righteous through the righteousness of Jesus. And as Jesus, listen, as Jesus is Lord uh, of our lives and he lives within us, we want to now live our lives in such a way that the world knows we belong to him. Again, it's not a pass. I can just live however I want. No, no. If you can just live however you want, I, I would suggest that Jesus is not Lord. If you can just do whatever I want, I can just do whatever I want. It's, it's my body, whatever I feel goes. No, no, no. Then Jesus must not be Lord. Master. Boss. This body must not be a temple of the living God. This body, Scripture declares, was purchased with a high price. His precious blood. Can I encourage us? Challenge us every time we want to do something just out of pleasure or what we think will benefit me. Consider the high price to shed blood on Calvary that was poured out for your forgiveness and my forgiveness so that we might have life. Romans chapter 13 verse 8 says, do not owe anyone anything. Except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Do you see that? The, the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And any other commandment are summed up by this commandment. Do you see it? Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the call to the church. This is the distinction of the church. How do we love? This, this word neighbor a, refers to our fellow man. Yes, the person sitting next to you, but also the person that lives next to you. Also the person that works next to you. Also the person that drives next to you. Also the person that walks next to you in, in that grocery aisle. That fellow man, what a lover, neighbor as yourself. Verse 10 says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Don't, don't miss this as we bring it all together. Love is the fulfillment of the law. The law is not the fulfillment of love. Let me be clear. The law is not the fulfillment of love. The person, Jesus, who is love, is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus has done what we could not do for ourselves. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, He made the one who did not sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become what? The righteousness of God. Do you see this? The righteousness of God. 1 John 2, 2, he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. John 3, 16, for God loved the, the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. The law is not the fulfillment of love. Jesus, who is love, is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus 
has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. As we close today, uh, I had the privilege of had the privilege of leading a funeral last night, and I I do not take. Uh, no celebration of life's for granted. I um, every time I stand with the family and stand before the family and friends, I'm reminded of the opportunity to pause and consider this life. How many of you know this life, man, it just seems to come and go. It's like, before we know it, 2025 is already here. <laughs> Christmas only like, you know, two weeks away or something. <laughs> I don't know the exact count, but a little more than that. But, but just life seems to go so fast. And have you ever considered that? I feel like I'm just caught up in just so busy. Everybody wants something. It used to be people knocking on the doors, then it was phone calls, now it's text messages. It's like, good grief. Delete, report is junk. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, last week, uh, a week ago, one of the things I told Audrey is I, I just need to get away slow down a little bit. Opportunity opened up. Like, like I had like, I don't know, a month notice. <laughs> hey, a few pastors are going to go to Israel and we're going to kind of stand with Israel. We're going to pray for Israel. We're going to encourage people. We're going to see some sites, see some new sites, talk about future trips and, and all this. Like, meet with the Department of Tourism and do all these different things. And but I told Audra more than any of that, I just need to go and for my soul to be refreshed. And I tell you, it was refreshed. And the first day, the first day were of the tour really set the tone for me. Usually, I, for those that might not know, I'm the I'm the out front guy. And I, I love, I love, I love the calling on my life. I'm thankful that out of anyone, God would call me for such a time as this to lead this church, to lead this association of churches throughout the Treasure Coast. And, but the first day really set the tone. I found myself at the first site, Caesarea Maritime, a site where Herod the Great built this city. The city should have never been there, but he was Herod the Great. He was going to do whatever he wanted. So he built this incredible city. And, and I kind of took a step back from the seven other pastors that were there. And I just began to pray, Lord, help me to listen for your voice this week. Help me to see what you want me to see. Help me to hear what you want me to hear. I don't know where you find yourself today. But you know what? Uh, pastoring now 20 years in different capacities, I've seen a whole lot of Christians come in the church. I'm going to let the Lord do what he does and judge them whether they are Christians or not. I, I've seen a whole lot of people come and a whole lot of people go over the years in different ministries. And, and you know what saddens me the most is I see people surrender everything over to the Lord and begin to live for him and have such a fire. And that's not what saddens me, by the way. But it's what takes place years down the road. See, somehow we get to a place where we're comfortable. Or somehow we get to a place where 
We've forgotten that Jesus actually went to the cross and shed his blood for me. And, and you know what I see? It is we almost come back into the before Christ where we're working to be this good person rather than allowing the righteousness of Jesus to just overwhelm us and the gospel to sink deep within us. And I pray, I pray that the church that is called Discovery each day that God gives us breath, you would pause and allow the gospel to saturate your heart. And you would surrender each day over to him and say, Lord, use me for your glory this day. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? to the believers just for a moment. Those that have confessed Jesus as Lord, surrendered it all over to him, received the gift of salvation. Let me talk to you just for a moment. Hey, when was the last time that, that you just said, thank you, Lord, for saving me? Maybe it's been a while since you've Since you pause to remember that that you were headed to hell, but Jesus stepped in, rescued you. That there is hope in Jesus. There is life in Jesus. That you're able to love that person. You're able to forgive that person. You're able to live for the glory of God, that there is no wasted life. Jesus has placed you exactly where you are for his purposes. And would you stop questioning, God, why am I here? Why am I here? And you would just say, take my life and use me for your glory. Would you thank him? Would you praise him for how good he's been and faithful he will be? All, all across the house and, and those online, would you just thank him? Maybe there's one here today that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus and today would be the day of salvation for you. Today would be the day that you reach out and you accept this gift this gift, even though it doesn't make sense because it seems like everything in this world, there, there's, a, there's an attachment. There's something attached to it. There's nothing free. But I tell you, this gift of salvation is it's free and free indeed. And Jesus offers salvation, the forgiveness of sins, the hope of heaven to you right here, right now. So those in the house, those online, if that's you, never received it, would you just say, dear Jesus, I, I am a sinner, for all have sinned, your, your word says, I'm a sinner and you are the Savior, you are the Savior. And so today, today, forgive me of all my sins. I surrender everything over to you. I believe in you that you came to this earth, you died on a cross, you were placed in a grave and you rose victorious for me. So today, for the rest of my days, I follow you. Thank you for saving me. If that's you, would you thank him for saving you? In a moment, we're going to sing this song. and 
Maybe you need to continue to pray. Maybe that needs to be your posture. I don't know. I don't want to tell you how to worship through song. <laughs> Maybe you need to consider these lyrics as they scroll through the screens. Maybe you just need to draw a circle around you and say, God, would you revive me? Revive me. There's going to be men and women. If you're in the house, there's going to be men and women in the corners of the front here that would love to pray with you. If you find yourself going through something, a challenging time, a weighty time, a discouraging time, a confusing time, whatever time, hey, even a happy time, <laughs> celebratory time, whatever it is, would, would you have the courage when we begin to sing this song, would you have the courage to step out and come forward? If you're online, we have a host that would love to pray with you. Would you let us know how we can pray for you? Just comment right there in the chat. Lord Jesus, we love you because you first loved us. Thank you for how good and faithful you are. Thank you that there is no one like you. Thank you that you loved me enough. That you came and died for my sins. Lord, you accomplished what I could not on my own. I could never reach that standard of righteousness, that standard of perfection. And so, Lord, thank you for how good you are, have been, and will be. And may our lives reflect your goodness to a lost, dark, and dying world. We ask this in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.